Hey everybody, thanks for checking out the channel. What happens if you cut a spring in half? Does it get stiffer or softer? And what happens if you stretch it longer? On this channel, we look at the science behind our grown-up toys. If you already know the answer, you probably aren't watching this video any longer. So for those of you who are curious, forget everything you think you know about how a spring works. Springs are actually in torsion, meaning the wire twists along the full length of the wire. The fact that it's wound into a coil really doesn't change the underlying principle. Let's look at some quick math. A coil spring is actually just a long torsion bar. A torsion bar is a fancy way of saying a rod or a bar that experiences twist. If you apply a torque to one or both ends, the bar twists. It kind of looks like this, only it doesn't permanently twist, it springs back. A coil spring is simply a torsion bar that's been wound up into a coil. It acts exactly the same. The wire twists when the spring is compressed. Think of it this way. The longer the wire, the easier it is to twist. The thicker or larger the diameter of the wire, the harder it is to twist. Making sense? Let's take a quick look at the equation for spring rate. Little k is the spring rate, or the number indicating how stiff or soft a spring is. Little d is the diameter of the wire. Notice that it's the power of 4, and it's on top of the equation. This means that the wire diameter has a big influence on spring stiffness. This is why in RC crawlers and other RC cars, it's a challenge to get really soft springs because thin wires are also not very strong and hard to manufacture. Next you have N, which is simply the number of coils. This is a simple way to calculate the length of the wire. Just count how many times the wire goes around the diameter of the circle. Now the last variable is big D, diameter of the spring. Technically, this is the average coil diameter from the middle of the wire to the middle of the wire. And since you know the diameter of the wire, you can measure to the outside of the springs and figure out the average coil diameter pretty easily. So you only need three numbers to figure out the spring rate or spring stiffness. But this also shows us something else. You will notice that the overall length of the spring is not a variable in the equation. That's because it doesn't matter. If you take your spring, stretch it really long, permanently deforming it, you have not changed the length of the wire. You still have the same number of coils. So if you cut the number of coils in half, then this number is half. And since this number is on the bottom of the equation, it divides the final answer. If it's on top, it multiplies the final answer. Imagine if D gets bigger, then that multiplies and your stiffness goes up. But if N gets smaller because you're eliminating coils, then you're dividing by a smaller number, which means your answer also gets bigger. Visualize it this way, looking at just the wire diameter. When little d goes up, let's say it's 10 and it goes to 1000, you're multiplying your answer by a much bigger number. So your stiffness value goes up. 10 times versus 1,000 times. That should make sense. The bigger the wire diameter, the stiffer it's going to be. The number of coils is the exact opposite since the variable is on the bottom of the equation and you divide by a big number, you're going to get a much smaller answer. So more coils equals softer spring. Less coils equals a stiffer spring. Everyone still with me? Now let's do a real life measurement to confirm. Let's start with one full length spring and we'll cut it in half and we'll measure the force and see what happens. So you may have seen this apparatus in uh, my other videos. What I'm gonna do is just uh, put the spring in here, compress it a fixed amount. So spring rate is force over a given distance. For example, grams per millimeter, ounces per inch, feet per inch, Something like that. We'll start by measuring a full length spring. I'm going to set this to, I want to set this to grams just because it's, uh, uh, for me, an easy unit to picture. And so we'll install it here, zero it out, 
Now, I don't have to calculate the actual spring rate. I just want to see if the force doubles or gets cut in half when I cut the spring in half. So what I'm going to do is just induce exactly uh, 10 millimeter displacement and note the force. Three hundred and six grams. Let's see if it returns back to zero. Yep. Do it a couple times to get a good reading. Returns to zero. All right. So the full spring rate is three hundred and six grams per ten millimeters. And now I'm going to cut the spring in half. I don't know why you would cut a spring in half, but I'm going to make sure and use the proper cutters. These are heavy duty Knipex cutters. This is a very strong hardened steel. So you definitely don't want to use your lighter weight electronic flush cutters. So I'm going to cut this in half as closely as I can. I'm going to try to get it dead center, but I'm really just trying to determine whether the force drops in half or if it doubles when I cut the spring in half. So I'm going to start by counting. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six. So it's probably... All right. There we go. Not too bad. Now, one thing that's worth noting is we've now changed what's called the end conditions of the spring. What we have here is what's called a closed and ground end, meaning the wire has been bent back on itself. So this wire curves back on itself and touches right here. And then it's been ground flat. If you look real closely, this surface has been ground flat. You can see this isn't a full wire here anymore. It's been ground flat. That's so the spring stays uh, nice and straight when it's being compressed. So almost all springs you're going to encounter are going to have a closed ground flat end. Now, this end is no longer closed, nor is it ground. There's going to be a bit of a discrepancy in the spring rate coming from the fact that this isn't a closed end anymore. But again, we're just trying to get a rough idea whether the spring rate went up or down. So let's put the spring on here. I'm going to give it just a little bit of preload. Okay. So again, we're just going to measure the displacement over 10 millimeters. So I'm overloading the gauge, which is not a good practice, but I think you can tell this force is now 626, which is double what it used to be. So there you have it. Cut a spring in half and the spring rate or the opposing force doubles. Because the spring is half the length, you've got half the wire to compress your spring rate actually goes up. Cut the spring in half, your spring rate doubles. Next up, what happens if you stretch a spring? On a properly designed spring, you should not be able to shorten the spring by compressing it. You can't get the material into the permanent yield range, but you can overstretch a spring and permanently deform it so its free length is longer. Does it make it stiffer, softer, or perhaps neither? Remember that overall length is not a variable in the spring rate equation. As long as the wire diameter and the number of coils is the same, then it doesn't matter what the free length of the spring is. If you stretch it longer, you have not changed the spring rate. But you will likely change the preload, which is something completely different. Let's say you have a fixed distance that your spring has to fit in, like on your shock then making the spring longer means you have to compress it to fit back into that space. You aren't adding coils, you aren't changing the wire diameter, so the spring is not getting stiffer. But you are adding preload. In this case, what you will be changing is simply your ride height, and I have an entire video that I highly recommend 
on the difference between preload and spring rate. Now, can we demonstrate this in real life? All right, let's see what happens if we stretch a spring longer than it's meant to be. So you can't really make a spring shorter. Springs are designed not to move into the permanent yield range. So no matter how much you compress it, you're really never going to get the spring to be shorter than it is right now. But we can definitely pull it longer if we want. So let's start with uh, just a baseline measurement. I'm going to zero this out and let's just push it uh, 10 millimeters and get a reading. So this spring right here is 314 grams per 10 millimeters. We'll do it a couple times just to make sure. Goes back to zero, that's good. 314. All right. So the spring right now is about 45 millimeters long. And let's stretch it to maybe 45, let's stretch it to maybe 60 or 70. Going to try to grab just the very ends. Wow, that barely moved. I'm going to have to go crazy on it. Let's take a little more aggressive approach. All right. All right. It's also a little bit crooked. See if we can fix that a little bit. All right, so now we're about 65. All right, so we've got a little bit of preload. We're gonna zero that out. And again, we'll push it 10 millimeters, see what happens. All right, zero the force. Three oh eight. So now it's three oh eight at the same ten millimeters. So we stretched the spring and the force changed from three fourteen to three oh eight. I would say that's well within experimental error and my ability to measure it. Also it makes sense that the longer spring gets a tiny bit softer because what's happened here is the angle between the closed coil that's flat and the active coil coming off is now greater because I stretched it more open. So this first active coil doesn't lay down as quickly against the closed coil. So there's a very slight difference in the end conditions, which might contribute to this small discrepancy. But for the most part, I would consider these spring rates the same. Now let's um, try one more thing. All right, so we're going to compress the spring to 10 millimeters and zero it out. And then I'm gonna compress it another 10. So we're back closer to the original length and see what happens. Any guesses? All right, so even though we started 10 millimeters deeper into the compression, we're still at 308. So that just demonstrates no matter where you are in the spring compression, you've got the same force per 10 millimeters. It doesn't matter if you start here or here or here, every 10 millimeters that you compress the spring is gonna be about 310 grams worth of force. That is your spring rate. So there you have it. If you stretch a spring longer, you're not changing the spring rate.